Um, I will be. Uh, I will give you a, a brief introduction, uh, some technical information. Uh, so, hi everybody! Welcome to the virtual conference, reimagining our words from below, organized by Society for the Study of Social Problems, to its two committees that address transnational initiatives, the Transnational Initiatives Committee and the Ad hoc Virtual Transnational Initiatives Committee. This conference is hosted by the Orfalia Center for Global and International Studies of the University of California, Santa Barbara. Thanks for being here today. Today we host session nine, Single Parents, Challenges and Resistance, for which I'm the organizer. Uh, let me introduce myself briefly. I'm Morena Tartari. Currently, I'm a research fellow at the University of Southampton and the former Maris Lodoska Curie fellow at the University of Antwerp in Belgium. Moreover, I'm one of the um, uh, members of the um, Transnational Initiatives Committee. Before starting with, I would like to remind you some general rules and guidelines for this session. Please keep your microphones muted to avoid echoism. If you are experiencing bandwidth issues, try to turning off your camera. Uh, this session will be recorded. If you do not agree with the recording, you should leave the virtual room now. And in the chat box, you will find two items posted by Patty Thomas. Uh, both of these links are posted also on the front page of the conference. So the first link is to, uh, is to the, um, the committee guest book. So you can add your name to the SSP Transnational Initiatives Committee guest book if you want to receive future announcement about uh, the committee conferences activity and events. And then with the other link, you can provide feedback about the conference. So this uh, live session will last, uh, would last one hour and a half. Uh, unfortunately, I will have, uh, uh, I will leave 10, 15 minutes before the end due to family obligations. So we have one hour and 15 minutes uh, for our conversation. Uh, in this session, we host the three fantastic presenters. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, um, I, I'm sorry for the pronunciation of your name. You can correct me if, uh, if uh, I make mistakes. So um, we have Eliane Egler, uh, who is an independent researcher from Switzerland with the presentation, um, the video presentation, what's at the root of our children's mental health crisis, uh, a legal comparative um, of two case studies in the USA, Switzerland and Scottish law, uh, and the Scottish law tool on how family law can create social injustice for children and single parents. Then we have Rashmi Karnatjani uh, from the University of Toronto, Canada, with a presentation from Mrs. Uh, to Mrs. Uh, to Doctor, I'm sorry, <laughs> Mother in Working and Talking Back. And then we have, uh, sorry for the pronunciation again, Meng Zing Ma from the University of St. Andrews, Scotland, with the presentation uh, Mapping Out Australian Single Mother Families Housing Insecurity experiences and coping strategies through a multidimensional framework. So um, I should remind you that this live session is not a traditional session with full presentation, but it aims to be a discussion among presenters, uh, among participants. So um, I would ask presenters for giving a short presentation of their research in uh, five, 10 minutes, and then we can start the discussion. And for questions and comment, meanwhile, you can use the chat box or raise your hand or join the discussion after the presentation of the short presentation. Just a note about my style of conduction. I'm used to be quiet and informal, so I will call you with your name, your, your first name, but please feel free to, to do the same with me or to do otherwise, not a problem, absolutely. Thank you. Welcome everyone, Diana and Cynthia. Hey, good morning. Yeah, good morning. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> My time, so, but, yeah. Thank you. I've already started with a brief introduction, and so I can leave uh, the I can uh, leave the word the floor to uh, Eliane for a short presentation of our research in five ten minutes, and then yeah, thank you. Yes, um, thank you for this opportunity to be here as an independent researcher. Um, so I started getting into this topic um, 
as I was a single parent facing divorce myself, finding out that I had a partner who was uh, suffering a parent, actually, he, my partner became a parent. And that is when I found out for the first time that, that we were facing a substance use disorder and that it was very, very endangering for the child. So um, that's how my focus really turned into that uh, area. How does, how does law, how does family law meet that topic? Um, and especially when you have a lot of recommendations um, from social workers that are, as far as I now know, um, not adequate um, in order to really protect a child, um, shorthand as well as long-term. Um, and it started with a mere gut feeling, I have to say, that something was just not right with the system. Um, and that foremost, that alcoholism and substance use disorders are not primarily and only, um, I would say, transmitted due to biosensitivity, meaning that people can inherit it uh, because of genetics. So I then went into um, what are activated genes? Um, does it, what does it take for a child to become an addict because of one of the parents having been an addict? Um, how is it activated? And to my astonishment, um, I found out that a lot of it happens through what takes place in a like what pl takes place in family systems after a child is born. So it's really not just genetically um, a given. And that on one hand um, is a great plus when we look at it as a society. Um, and it also means that we have to understand uh, the topic from a legal perspective. So that when you go to court and let your uh, judge know what's happening in a marriage, um, what I, what I found out from so many women was that most judges simply say, well, but that's, that's the mother or that's their father. So they have to go see that child. Um, and perhaps the most baffling um, example that I can give to you, there are actually two, is um, when you have a child that has been reportedly sexually abused by a parent. Um, you don't really have evidence in most cases. A mother or a father doesn't go film a parent who is sexually abusing or molesting their child. So you go to court, um, you report that. And what happens in most cases is that the child has to see, has to continue to see that um, abusing parent. And then we go ask ourselves why in the long run, um, a let's just say a, a, a girl who was sexually abused by um, her father happens to date the same predator again. And people have lots of therapy. And um, we must understand that therapy is altogether, it's great and it has its limitations. Um, and I would also like to say that children have the right to be to experience prevention and not just like, okay, you have to go see your abusing parent and then take care of yourself in the future. Um, you can do 20 years of therapy um, and let's see how well off you are. So that was one angle, um, one aspect that really uh, caught my attention where I had the instinct, um, I gotta do something about this. And the other one was um, when I found out that it was just a simple thought that occurred. Um, how come you're not allowed to drive your car when under influence? But then again, I was told by social workers, well, of course he can take care of uh, your son. Um, you know, he can, and I said, how so? And my own, at the time, my own attorney said, oh, he can drink from Monday through Friday. And um, when he sees the child every other weekend, he just won't be drinking. 
And I said, do you think that addiction works that way? That it leaves people with choice when they get to drink and when not? So um, that's how I got into the, went into the research. And the most beautiful experience, the blessed, ex most be blessed experience I had was um, that I got to meet Suzanne Mulvihill. And uh, her life story um, really propelled me into research where I said, she's this, like these children have gone through so much and the court system did absolutely not protect them. Um, here's an opportunity to change something. And that is my main motive for the future. Every single parent who would like to have a different court sentence, who would like to have their child protected can experience that. And it simply happens through educating. Education is the key. Um, judges are experts at law and they sometimes just need expertise in an area where a lot of silence is happening. And the silence happens through shame, denial. I haven't, I haven't heard anyone um, openly disclosing with a certain type of freedom that they have an alcoholic in their family. But I do experience when you open up the, this topic, this tender topic, um, simply through sharing yourself, people follow. Um, and they go, yeah, my uncle, oh, my cousin. Um, as I say, in every family, you find someone dealing with substance use disorder or alcoholism. And um, it somehow still remains a taboo. And people have it that it is, uh, it is something that happens in poorer families while we can look at very wealthy families and the same thing happens. It's, it's, it's really not about, it's not about money and education. Yeah. So I do, I stand for the ending of multi-generational trauma transfer um, because I've experienced it myself, um, how, how the court system protected my son and how this child is striving. And it, it also means that um, the, the addict itself is not, it, it's not about punishing that person or saying um, you're not a parent anymore but we need a support system of people who are social workers who are educated and um, I'm going to end my uh, my speech uh, my or, yeah my share here um, I hear a lot of people telling me oh you can't change the world and you can't uh, like what are you going to do are you going to save the world and I say no because it's happening. It has happened in Scotland and it's happening in Australia. So it can happen in each and every law system around the globe. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jen, for your contribution. Thank you very much. So I prepared uh, some questions and comments for you, but um, I wait uh, later after the, the other presentations. So I, I would leave the floor to Rashmi. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you. It is lovely to be here with all of you, <clears throat> especially because uh, it's, it's at the margins that this work gets done because I too am now an academic, um, I mean, I am an independent researcher, you can say, though I haven't started that aspect of independent research yet. I um, defended my dissertation from the University of Toronto, which is why you see uh, University of Toronto mentioned beside my name. I uh, live and work in uh, the greater Toronto area in uh, Ontario, Canada. And I am a kindergarten to grade 12 
special education consultant within public education, publicly funded education in the school board here. So a quick snapshot of uh, <clears throat> who I am, where I am and the problematic. So I am an institutional ethnographer. So as uh, I follow the work and I do my work in the alternative sociology that was developed by Dorothy Smith. And I uh, look at my research, I work with my research participants, not looking at them as uh, objects, but as standpoint informants who are experts in their experience. So in listening to uh, the previous presentation, I was very excited from my institutional ethnography mindset to say, that's exactly it. When you foreground the experiences of people going through and how these texts written by experts in social work talk to the uh, legal justice system and talk to other people and create a narrative in which the child and the person who is the primary caregiver for the child are completely subsumed and invisibilized, right? So that was my takeaway from the previous session. Uh, my family of four came to Ontario in 2002 with nine bags, two children and no jobs, as was Canada's immigration promise that you come here and make it work. Uh, <clears throat> I have a degree in science and uh, I began to volunteer in my children's school because my pharmaceutical uh, background from previously was not going to help me here since I have no family here. And I didn't want to leave my children age three and seven at that time uh, in the care of strangers. Uh, their father was working within the pharmaceutical industry and I sought to get into education. Um, long story short, I got my B.Ed. though after jumping through hurdles of transcripts, which uh, internationally trained uh, teachers need to get every single time, especially those who come from uh, countries that are not, whose education systems are not valued in the Western world, right? So texts, talking to texts has always been a part of my experience, although I didn't know it at that time because it's asking a fish what is water, because you're in it. You don't, you're not able to describe it until you get the language. So I finished my B.Ed. I started working in public education, teaching science first, and then got my additional qualifications courses and started working as a special education teacher. And I taught students in grade seven and eight. And in Ontario, elementary education goes from kindergarten to grade eight, and then students go to grade nine and 12, 9 to 12 for high school. And uh, since I taught students with special education needs, oftentimes their mothers would talk to me and uh, they would ask, what's going to happen of him? Or what's going to happen of her? Or what's going to happen to her? Some of them, if they were multilingually fluent, would speak to me in their heritage languages because I speak six languages in addition to English that are traced back to South Asia. And uh, when I would talk to them about high school course selection, often they would have questions that would perplex me a little, you know, but I would do my best to explain and then they would get it and they would move on. It's not until my daughter was in the same age group of grades seven and eight and high school selection became my mothering work that I began to realize why I got it and they didn't. Because until then, that disjuncture between my academic and work knowledge privilege and their lack of the same thing had not come into view for me. I just took it for granted. And I would explain things to them from my institutional capture. And I hadn't realized that I got things, I understood things better because I knew the work. And uh, Around that time, I decided to apply for my graduate school as well. And uh, when I went forward, University of Toronto rejected my application because they said I had a three-year degree from India and not a four-year undergrad degree. And I had also applied to York University and they accepted me. And for that exclusion from the University of Toronto, I'm extremely grateful because had that not happened, I would not have met Alison Griffith. 
Alison Griffith is my MED supervisor, and she is an expert in institutional ethnography, especially having co-written the book Mothering for Schooling with Dorothy Smith. And I did my MED with Alison Griffith, and I worked with women who looked like me because I was placed in a school where the predominant population was what in the global market is known as South Asia. Right, and they were South Asian women, and that label itself invisibilizes the trajectories of people's lives, right? Because people from Indo Caribbean indentureship are also labeled as South Asian. People from Mauritius through indentureship are also labeled South Asian, right? Pakistani, Indian, and Bangladeshi women, in spite of years of uh, colonial rule and resultant conflict, through partition left to us as a gift by empire are also labeled South Asian, right? And that was my standpoint because I was like, hmm, mothers who look like me experience something that's different from what I experienced, what's going on here. And that's the research I began with in grade seven and eight, what mothering work are they doing for transition to high school? But when I began with my dissemination, I realized that there were more barriers than I had thought. My school board didn't want to hear about it because they said, oh, maybe because these mothers are South Asian and they were not educated here. So the common sense sexism and racism there is all women who look like me were not educated here. That is the understanding, right? Then the issue was, oh, you have a sample size of just seven mothers. So those voices don't count because I have an, I am not a quantitative researcher. So that happened. And another thing was, oh, you're not teaching in this thing anymore. It's going to add to the work of other people if you ask to do an action research project. So I shelved that institutionally, but inside me, it was still simmering. So I thought to myself, okay, now, if you want to take race off the table, if you want to take South Asian-ness off the table, let's go there. So for my doctoral dissertation, I did something which was intentional, yet very subversive. I decided to do an institutional ethnography of mothering work for students in the years of grade four to six. The reasons were from grade one to three, class sizes in Ontario are capped at 23. You, don't, you cannot have more than 23 children in a class. From grade four, that cap is removed. So you can have as many as 30 children in a class. So from grade to six, there are large groups of children and the curriculum demand changes from learning to read and it becomes reading to learn. So in grade four to six, children are expected to understand what they read because it is assumed that we have already taught them how to read now, you know? And the question was at the end of grade six, there is a, a standardized test that happens, which is the EQAO or the Education Quality Accountability Office by the government of Ontario that determines which schools are doing well and which schools are not doing well, okay? And then immediately kids get funneled into grade seven and eight and whoosh, they get sucked into high school. So I decided what's happening in this black box that we don't know about, you know? No one's talking about grades four to six. Let's talk to teachers, let's talk to mothers. So I spoke to 10 of each. And I did not go through school boards because they would have made me jump through hoops until I gave up. So I contacted socially. I put that in my research proposal and I sent out my posters through social media and people just came. I had to tell them, oh, I have my 10th person already. I'm not interviewing more people. So the findings are in my presentation and it's interesting now because the conversation comes back to saying what's actually going on in schools in the tensions between the work that is done by teachers and mothers. Is there one way of doing it? And when people talk about South Asian, who exactly is South Asian? What does that even mean, right? So, Folks turn to me now and they say, wait a minute, I thought you were just looking at mothers and teachers and you were not looking at South Asian mothers. 
And I said, okay, if that's what you thought, that's great. But I look in the mirror every day and I know how you see me. You see, so when I'm talking back, Institutional ethnography allows me to talk back because I say, look what your texts are doing. Look how you're talking about me and people who look like me. Look what is going into your reports and look how those reports are making these trajectories happen, right? And another thing is returning the gaze because you know, you know right in the pit of your stomach, what is that gaze that people are throwing at you? So as Foucault says, you do not need arms, you do not need weapons, a gaze is enough. So when I get sidelined for a promotion, I'm like, yeah, I get it. I can never be the face of your school board. I know what you see me as, right? And there is absolute freedom in being able to do this work at the margins. And I cannot thank Patty and Morena enough for letting us do this work at the margins and continue to stand strong and in solidarity with one another. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rashmi, for your presentation. Thank you. Then we had time for a discussion later. And now I leave the floor to Mengi Ma. Thank welcome. you. Welcome. Thank you, Morena. Thank you for uh, organizing this panel discussion and uh, Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Uh, and uh, very, it's my pleasure to be here to share my research and also maybe some of my lived experience with you and listen to your research and uh, your experience. So I guess I will just uh, give a brief uh, a background of my research first including the practical background and the theoretical framework of this research. And then I guess I will share some stories of uh, our single mothers about their housing experiences. So this research, uh, I personally, currently I'm a, a PhD student uh, in human geography at the University of St. Andrews. But uh, uh, this research is based on my social work placement uh, when I did my social uh, master of social work uh, um, study. So the practical uh, uh, background and also the theoretical framework are all informed by my social work uh, theory and practice. And uh, so the, this uh, research is conducted uh, in collaboration with uh, an agency called Council of Single Mothers and Their Children. This agency is based uh, in Victoria and uh, Australia. So this agency has a service program named the Single Mother Housing Register, which is a Facebook group to assist uh, single mother families to find another single mother families to share uh, housing in order to reduce the housing costs. And uh, so in this Facebook group, we can say the experiences of uh, single mothers in terms of their housing insecurity and their coping strategies. And at the time of this research was conducted, there was around 1,300 single mothers in that Facebook group. And uh, uh, in this research, housing insecurity is uh, used as an umbrella term. So many forms of housing problems are included, such as the unaffordability and overcrowding, uh, lack of belonging, insecurity of tenure, and so on. And uh, uh, in Australia, single mother families uh, are one of the most vulnerable uh, groups, uh, social groups encountering housing insecurity issues. And we acknowledge that uh, uh, a single father families are there, uh, but we all know that uh, uh, one parent families is almost uh, gendered. For instance, in Australia, 83% of uh, one parent families is uh, headed by single mothers. So based on my, uh, the, we call the strong-based approach. So in this, in this research, we um, 
are not only looking at the risk factors of these insecurity issues, but also we look at uh, uh, the resilience, the protective factors that single mothers uh, having to help them to encountering uh, housing insecurity issues. And uh, yeah, so the methodology used is that uh, uh, we analyzed around five years of the comments and posts in that Facebook group, which included uh, 421 wall posts and more than 2000 comments. We analyzed this content and identify some themes uh, re relevant to our research questions. So uh, next I'm going to share some uh, uh, experience and uh, some striking stories with you of our single mothers. For example, our single mother, they uh, experience many housing insecurity issues and the one is unaffordable housing. So for our mothers, uh, home ownership is almost unaffordable. And also the, uh, the, rent, the, the housing in the private rental market is also very high and unaffordable. For example, one single mother family. So that mother, she was unable to live within her own hometown because the, the, rental, uh, in that, the rental price in that place has increased so much. She has to move away from her own hometown. And she refers this as a, a shame. And the next insecurity problem is the struggles in the private rental market. Like uh, some of our mothers, they are turned down for 25 times to get a rental house. And the uh, next problem is high mobility, which means that the free, very frequent moves in rental houses. For example, one mother and her one-year-old and seven-year-old children had moved four times within seven months to so between different shared accommodations. And uh, uh, another problem is very, which is very common is homelessness. One example is very kind of heartbreaking. It's one mother and her 11-year-old son, they have lived in a camper run without power and bathroom for around one year and without any other support. And uh, uh, we used a multi-dimensional framework to locate uh, different uh, risk and protective factors uh, because we, we think that uh, uh, every individual they has their inner world and also outer world. Uh, then the inner world include their biological, psychological, and spiritual dimensions, and outer world includes uh, such as relational, social, and structural and cultural dimensions. So uh, in each dimension, it has it has some risk and protective factors. And uh, uh, I'm not going to go through uh, by each factors but I just want to highlight it something. For example, we found some protective factors. Uh, the mainly two protective factors, one is the positive psychosocial characteristics of our single mothers. Uh, that means uh, they felt grateful, they felt hopeful uh, about uh, their situations, whatever the situation is uh, hard for them. So this kind of positive, uh, personality, uh, keep them uh, uh, going in front of these uh, uh, problems. And another uh, protective factor is kind of the social support happened within these single mother communities. So we observed uh, both four dimensions of social support, such as instrumental information, emotional and appraisal support. But we can say that these two types of protective uh, uh, factors are kind of located in their uh, inner world and also their social and relational dimensions. So from another side, then how about the structural dimension? So the almost all the factors we identified in the structural dimension actually are 
risk factors for our single mother families. So especially the failure of social services, because we think that the social services we provide to our vulnerable groups should be a protective factor for them. But the re reality is opposite. So I'm going to give uh, two examples about the uh, structural dimension, the failure of social services. So one is public housing. So the, the first is the long waiting list seems hopeless for our single mother families. Uh, for instance, one mother uh, rece who received a disability pension tried to register for social housing, but was told that 40,000 people were on, the, were on the waiting list. And also, although some mothers, they registered for public housing, they were not put in the highest need or viewed as an emergency case. Why? Because they were in the private rental housing. They were not physically being on the streets. But as a mother, so you think whatever the, 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 your situation, you will not let your children to be on the streets. So this is a very, uh, very ironic uh, problem. And another thing is uh, uh, fam family law system, I guess uh, there is some overlapping with uh, another presenter in this panel. So the family law system, so our mothers use the words uh, like uh, the worst, discriminated, no face in the system and facilitate the abusers, silence our voices. So these are all the words and uh, used by our single mothers to show their disappointment, desperation, anger, and helpless towards the family law system. And some mothers, they had a long and exhausting court battle to keep themselves and their children safe from their former partners lasting like three years, eight years, or even 10 years. So what I wanted to highlight is that uh, uh, although we found some protective factors uh, within our single mother families that also uh, prove that some psychosocial intervention or group-based intervention are efficient to support our families, but the structural problems need to be solved. We need a uh, mountain moving efforts, which is to tackle this uh, structural level barriers for our single mother families. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mangin, for your presentation and your contribution. So I, I will let uh, uh, the floor to um, the other participants for questions and comments, uh, in particular to Diana, that I think she prepared <laughs> some questions uh, as a discussant. Then I have also my questions, but later. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, good day. Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon, everyone. From where? From where you are? Where we are in the Philippines? It's almost twelve midnight. So, um, I just wanted to thank all the participants, all the presenters, for their very insightful um sharings and presentations. And um, I actually wanted to <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I I just wanted to ask, and anyone can answer this. I wanted to ask how um. If anyone would like to speak to this question, how doing research with marginalized groups has, um, like, if anyone would like to discuss how any challenge, uh, how they've encountered any challenges in their particular work in conducting research with marginalized groups, if anyone would like to speak to this, especially as you want to make the case for your respective um, underrepresented um, populations in your research. I know some of you touched on this in your presentation, but if anyone wants to elaborate on this, um, please, the floor is yours. Um, when you say marginalized groups, anyone, not necessarily single parents? Um, yes, like um, from the audience, you can open it up for the audience. And you know, let, let's see how it interfaces also with the presenter's work. Yes, Dr. Ligaya. 
Uh, yes, because I've been studying really marginalized groups, marginalized women, and the I started with uh, peasant women in the Philippines, so I stayed in the village, and I wanted to see their problems, and I try, and that's where I evolved the organic feminist inquiry, and then I studied uh, migrant women in Hong Kong, Taiwan, Vancouver, Rome, and then. Uh, uh, Chicago, and I considered them marginalized women because they were in domestic service work, and I discovered a lot of abuses. And uh, of course, the state policy, labor export policy, and the state policies within the receiving countries also interplay in marginalizing them. And my current research is on the indigenous communities in the Philippines. Uh, and I would say they are marginalized. Uh, we, <clears throat> historically, they have been marginalized in Philippine society. <clears throat> and the entry of corporate mining there further marginalizes them uh, because of dispossession of, of their lands by transnational corporations. And uh, also there are um, violations of their human rights especially the UN uh, Declaration of Indigenous uh, People's Rights that has universal application. And they, they, the, the right to life, the right to environment, the right to development, the right to ancestral lands, all of these are violated. So one of the things that might be unique and is hardly addressed um, is the militarization. <clears throat> how militarization actually impact uh, more evidently and more seriously the lives of, in, of uh, uh, migrants or the lives of marginalized groups. And this is not addressed very well yet. And maybe uh, I'm thinking like someday to come up with a session where we can take a look at the state aggressive action, sometimes uh, collaborating with other institutions. And it affects not only the people, the marginalized groups, but also the non-governmental organizations who are providing service. And then also the families, because when, you, when uh, a father or a mother, especially father or, or son or daughter are extrajudicially killed, then there's a lot of disruption in the family. So they become single parents. And uh, the trauma, I haven't researched on that, the lingering trauma in the family and, and because, of, because they are mostly poor, especially, especially like Duterte's extrajudicial killing of the, you know, in his drug war, we need to do more research on what happened to these families, what ha what's going on, and uh, uh, so the, the the issue of state aggression and violence, I think, uh, needs to be addressed because it has tremendous impact, including social movements of the poor. Uh, and we need to raise a public global challenge to these oppressive states. Thank you, Dr. Ligaya. Is there anyone else who wants to jump in that's here from uh, our presenters? Yes, please, Ms. Rashmi. Oh, was there someone else who wanted Rashmi. to speak? Oh, anyone okay. can jump in. Okay. Uh, yes, I think I was trained very well by the British to always raise my hand. So <laughs> that's what I do. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, on Monday, uh, this is a long weekend in the land that's now known as Canada, and uh, many people in the um, country will be celebrating Victoria Day, so that should tell me something. Anyway, uh, in terms of researching at the margins, I was thinking about how uh, even within a even within a uh, racial group that is perceived as homogenous for example, South Asian, right? There are margins even within there based on the institutional privileges that some of us have as insiders within the educational system, which is my field of work, and people who are 
outside that system. And uh, it's interesting because there is such a dis difference in the community I'm experiencing here with all of you in being able to share, but in the place of employment where my research would have actually helped my school board and other school boards in Ontario to make a difference for the lives of students and families, it is completely erased. You see, it is completely erased and I call it the yes but technique, right? So the pushback is so subtle. You know, the pushback is so subtle to anything that one wants to do that the teams that you're invited to collaborate in suddenly decide to do something different and you realize you're not on the mailing list. Or uh, things that you bring up at a meeting, folks will say to you, even superiors will say to you in a public forum, oh, I'm going to stop you right there. I know where you're going with this. And uh, I have had to turn off my camera at that time because it felt like a stinging slap across my face, right? Because I'm not speaking for marginalized mothers and they may be black, indigenous, South Asian, Tamil, Pakistani, anyone, right? In the schools that I support, but the very fact that they are not insiders, but I speak of them means that I am a thorn in the side, you know? And it's, it's become a fulfilling way of doing this now. You know, it, I think the, the beauty of it is embracing it, you know, and saying, okay, if this is where you're going to put me and I will stand here and I will fight, you know, I will stand right here where you have pushed me and from here I will fight. So that's okay, I guess, but that is the marginalization, you know, career paths are plateauing, you know, and uh, that's okay. You know, it's what the hill you choose to die on, right? And that's the price you pay and you're okay with that. Thank you, Dr. Rashmi. That's beautifully said. Um, is there anyone else would like to add? Yeah, uh, Kai, just to share some of my experience based on my personal uh, experience. It might be not a as the insightful as Dr. Rashmi and Dr. Liga shared. Uh, so I, I, I guess uh, take, taking the example of uh, this uh, single mother research, although this research is completely based on the content analysis, that means I didn't have a direct interaction with single mother families, but I did get uh, some chances to have a short interview with some uh, mothers with migration background uh, with the reference from the agency. So I would say being an insider uh, definitely is uh, a, an advantage to research with some uh, marginalized or disadvantaged group. And I forgot to share that the agency that I did my placement, actually they only uh, recruit the staff or interns or, or placement students who are single mothers themselves or who are raised in single mother families. So I guess we, either you are a practitioner or a researcher, when we share some the, the common identity with uh, uh, our clients or uh, our participants, that might be kind of easier to gain the trust from them. Uh, but I also acknowledge that you can't always be an insider because you will have different uh, research participants. Uh, for instance, my PhD research actually will focus on older migrants. So definitely I'm not a, a, an older person, I'm a young person, I'm an outsider for my participants. But uh, I think uh, from uh, in this kind of situation, personally, I plan to kind of spend some time, for example, being a volunteer in some older care center or kind of uh, age, uh, daycare center as a volunteer. So take some time to build trust with them. Then next step, uh, uh, continue my research with them. Because actually I, uh, indeed, I did some uh, volunteer work in, um, uh, in a daycare center, which pro pro 
pro pro provide care with older adults with dementia, and their clients are all kind of British and local age, aged person. And I remember that the first day when I was there, uh, we we were they they kind of they didn't accept me as a, a an insider with them. But uh, when I spent more time with them for three days or four days uh, along one month, two months, and uh, even though I'm a, uh, an Asian woman, a young student, but they still accept me as an insider to, to, to work with them. So I guess the insider and outsider is kind of fluent. It's up to the researcher. How do you identify yourself? and uh, identify yourself along with your participants. That is just based on my personal experience. Thank you. Thank you, Mengjing. Um, Eliane? Yeah, Dr. Elian, I would absolutely like to add what you just uh, said. You have to make yourself an insider. Um, when you research something, uh, because I, I heard the word uh, or the wording uh, fighting, I'm gonna continue my fighting. Um, I just realized in my personal work, also coaching clients through this process, there's a high chance that you are going to face as a single mother, a male judge. And when you're going to court and you're gonna be fighting against these bad, bad men, uh, you're gonna get fought back because no one, it's, it's, the question is how do you get into people's hearing? You're not, in my experience, you're not going to get into their hearing when you victimize yourself, when you make yourself part of um, a small group, uh, a small group that doesn't get the privileges, kind of like complaining. People automatically shut off and they become defensive. They push back. So in my work, when I, that's why I say children, it's 50% chance a boy or a girl, but they're children. And every judge, if he has children, he may have boys only or girls only, but he's a parent. So using words that make us, I would say connect. When you go into court and you ask for something, when you go into a meeting room and ask to be heard, how do I make how do I make myself with the topic that I have a part of everybody? And that's when you usually invite people to listening to you. Um, yeah, which is really essential because I hear it all the time. Like, oh, my husband, my husband, oh, these men, and oh, all these men that are drinking. And that's not going to get us anywhere. It's really about making it about humanity. And it's happening with gender fights. Um, the truth of the matter is, when you look at these uh, so re-socialization uh, programs for men in Scotland, they work, they're successful, and nothing happens with the woman. And it looks like that. The couple may separate, and then in the long run, if she doesn't do any personal work, she still has a concept of what men are and what they're not. Oh, they're useless. Oh, they're all dangerous. And there's such a high chance that she's going to get herself into a next abusive relationship, although she's divorced an abusive man or a drinker. She divorced that one, but she walks right into it again. And the other thing is, uh, as I mentioned, I, um, that, uh, no, I actually, I didn't mention it in my presentation, but it's important to understand that uh, even if the mother stays single, mostly boys step into the role of their father. They become the addict or the villain in the, in the family system. So this is just one example of uniting us. It takes work on each angle as human beings. So when you step into a room and say, I'm the minority, 
how do you get everybody, everybody's attention and build that, build empathy. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yes. Um, Dr. Ashmi, thank you, um, Dr. Uh, Attorney Elian. Um, Dr. Ashmi, you're raising your hand again. Uh, yes. Thank you so much for sharing that in terms of, uh, you know, the collective and the knowledge piece of uh, reaching out to people's humanity uh, to understand the big issues. It's interesting, uh, in the educational field also, uh, Ellen Brantlinger had written about dividing classes when she talked about how uh, uh, middle-class women narrate their and other people's children, right? And uh, in my field of work, uh, what happened was I used my research and made it more accessible to teacher unions because that becomes a point where the inter intersecting work of mothers and teachers happens, right? Because uh, when mothers raise a point about asking for more information, et cetera, if teachers say, oh, that's my professional judgment, then that's a line that mothers don't cross. Not just mothers, even principals don't cross that line. Right, because if you invoked the word professional judgment, then everything comes to a stop because then the union and the union's professional judgment text and discourse comes into view because the teacher has claimed a situational positionality of being an expert, right? So I decided to make my work accessible through practice journals. And I wrote for the Elementary Teachers uh, Federation of Ontario's magazine, which is called The Voice. And uh, teachers in my study had spoken about the power struggles that they have to endure from other teachers who are more powerful in their school when they advocate for marginalized students and families. <clears throat> so I wanted to reach out. And in that I used a sentence, which is my theorization of the blended standpoint. And I said, if this were my child, what would I want? What would I fight for? Okay, and it was well received. 82,000 members of the union read it. I still get emails. My school board converted it into a visual. Okay, however, when push comes to shove, when we are sitting in meetings, when marginalized mothers are talking about their children, this big picture understanding of all children are our children flies out the window in my experience in this work because teachers will continue to recommend for their students supports, safety plans, all kinds of exclusions from a mainstream classroom that they would never allow for their own child. You see? So there is a difference in what I notice in my professional standpoint. There is a difference between intellectually understanding that all children are our children but when it comes to what Lipsky calls street level bureaucracy, right? Handing out opportunities based on in the material matrix who people think are deserving and not deserving. You see, of handing it over, like some parents will say, will receive comments like, oh, I really liked how you spoke about your child with such an asset mindset. But other parents will be told, that's what you see, but this is what we see and this is what we'd like you to do. Right? Unfortunately, what you are seeing in your experience with the legal system has not trickled down into education. And I think it also depends on the fact that the intersectionality of the parent or the mother, especially a single mother, if a black woman is very different from that of a non-black mother. You see, so those issues are on the table because race is always on the table. And education likes to pretend it's a race neutral field, but it is not. And I'm wondering what it is like in other things. It, it, it happens to me in the legal field each day I walk into the courtroom. It is not something that um, I do once and then it's done. It's always a topic, but I do it nonetheless because it's conditioning. It's, uh, I, I see it as a conditioning, a human conditioning that we 
a lot of people are not even aware of. It, it's just yeah. dividing. Division happens every day, everywhere. Oh, they're not good enough because, and there are 10 and more reasons why you could divide yourself from someone, um, whether it be gender, whether it be race, whether it be education, so many reasons, but it's worth going in there and making that difference each time. Of course. No of matter course. what you hear back. Of course. You're doing it. That's what's essential. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's like a dog whistle, right? Only some of us hear it for, and some of us read it. For example, when we heard about the extremely excruciating incident of the sh uh, shooting in a grocery store in Buffalo recently, where a young white um, man went in and uh, shot people, right? And even before you know the identity and the race of the person who committed that atrocity, if you were to read, the shooter is now in custody, you immediately know that it's not a black man. In North America and everywhere in the world, if you are tuned in to the textual conversation, when they say the person is in custody, because if that were a black person out there, that person would not have lived through that, you know, invariably, you know? So when people say is in custody, the subtext for those of us who are connected to that conversation, and I'm not a black woman, right? But I'm a teacher of black students. I'm a friend of black mothers, right? So immediately, you know, when even before they tell you who the shooter is, if they say the perpetrator is in custody, or the perpetrator has been, unfortunately, whatever, whatever, that's the bifurcation of the street level bureaucrats and whom they chose to, you know, take their life and whom they chose to take into custody. Unfortunate, but every day we show up and we do the work. Every single day, we show up and we do the work. Thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to share, like, there is a thank you for your very rich insights, like discussing the ref, your ref experiences with reflexivity in your research, in your work, and also the role of agency among your research communities in the face of so much overwhelming um, structural oppressions. Um, like, you also touched that. My next question was actually on intersectionality, but you pretty much touched on it. So, yeah, I think like this is something that we can um, skip through. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Diana. I have, um, I have, um, it's just a comment, a question for all presenters. Uh, and um, I, I, I was wondering if there are, uh, in your research, in your experience, uh, if uh, these women, women in, in different um, contexts, so housing, uh, legal fields, uh, uh, education, if uh, when they have problems uh, like the, like these problems with housing and so on, are they able to organize themselves in uh, um, organizations, movements, uh, uh, make claims? Uh, because uh, I conducted research and uh, research study um, on uh, the transition on, uh, um, of women through the legal system. And I see on my results that uh, um, it's, it's in Europe, so it's a different context, but I have participants from different countries. And I see that uh, um, a prob very big issues at, uh, that is uh, these women have many, many problems in organizing themselves in, uh, in movement organizations, uh, and in asking help in an organized way. And they are single individuals, but they, there are really, really uh, many problems in joining other people and in trusting them. So yes, I was wondering if in your research, uh, these women are able to join and make claims uh, together. And uh, so, yeah, just, uh, just to talk about. I can only speak to that from my perspective when I work with, um, women who choose divorce um, when there's domestic violence and substance use uh, disorder in the family. Um, 
That's just my experience. Women who are married to a wealthy man who brings home, um, I'm going to say a chunk of money, they usually are not the ones who are ready to file, like they're not going to file divorce unless hell at home is burning so much that they really don't have another choice. Um, what I hear in that, uh, in that perspective is more of, uh, well, you see, I want my children to go to university. So how do I, how do I basically, how do I live through this? Staying married and having my children at home. How do I protect my children from what's happening while I stay in the marriage, while the children stay in the household? And then other women who are I'm I'm going to say the middle class who make enough money so that they can support the child and themselves and then evidentially have to bring their child to daycare uh, to continue working they choose to leave the man and that these are the kinds of women women who number one can afford to leave the man, and number two, who are interested in knowledge, understanding the mechanisms. These women are women that bond. Uh, they bond through sharing their experience and hope. Um, that's usually also where shame is pretty low. And then there's another uh, segment of, I'm gonna call them poorer families. Uh, where education oftentimes is, I don't know if it doesn't reach them, it's, uh, it's very obscured. That's what I can, uh, what I can see. Um, women bonding through saying, oh, that's how it's been forever. You know, my father has been an alcoholic and my grandfather, and we all, we've all gone through this suffering. So um, I'm not gonna step out of that. Uh, yeah, if that speaks, if that speaks to your question. Yeah, so it takes two. It takes women who want knowledge and who are willing to walk the walk. And it's, it's, not, a, it's not an easy walk either way. Being a single parent, also when you make money, um, I'm talking from the Swiss perspective mainly, when you make money, when you can afford to be a single parent, it is a daily struggle. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. Thank you. I, I have a question. Does any one of you panelists ever thought of expanding the concept of domestic violence so that we do not always look at the source of violence origin originating from the family, but that the source of violence coming from external, uh, like uh, pressure or violence from the state. And can you consider that as well as domestic violence when the impact is affecting the, the relations in the family, affecting the, uh, it be, they become, they lose a member of the family. So the mother becomes a single mom or uh, uh, a child, is taken away by state violence. Can you consider that domestic violence? Can we always, can we begin coming up with a paradigm of domestic violence that looks at the source of violence uh, into the family coming from other sources? Like uh, corporations, transnational corporations now have uh, defense forces uh, to contain resistance to some of their projects like extractive industries. And this has tremendous impact on family life. I call that uh, toxic patriarchy. Um, it's not talked about much how men are negatively impacted by corporations, by other men, by their own fathers, like male ruled, um, structures 
what it does to men. When a man comes home to his family, a man who has a lot of pressure, a man who has to make an earning for the family. Um, also social expectations. Uh, oh, you have a new car? Oh, so we need one too, honey. Did you see that? Did you see that family over there? Our neighbors, they have a new car and they have a bigger pool. Um, what does that do to a man? Um, and that's something I have, I'm seeing in Scotland that's working so well. They are bringing men together in group sessions, talking about that. What does malehood, manhood do when, it's, when it has a toxic form? So yeah, that's, that's, that's not talked about. We see the predator as the predator, the villain. The question is, how do you become a villain? Why did you become aggressive or violent? Yeah, I find that a great, great question that you just uh, had. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And the aspect of toxic patriarchy is very important to consider because, you know, the whole thing of uh, men have to be a particular way and how does that impact? So the question that was asked, I was also thinking of um, indigenous peoples in Canada or the land that is now known as Canada and the violence that is experienced is an issue that uh, it comes into the family through the impact of intergenerational trauma that has begun with the residential schools that were started in order to kill the Indian and the child as the government mandate was. And uh, last year around this time, uh, bodies of children were beginning to be found on school grounds of uh, residential schools. Uh, and those discoveries are still happening. And it's interesting because families themselves knew that their children were lost and they had not come home. But until indigenous families decided to go looking for their children, which is heartbreaking, the government did not do much in order to follow through on those claims that their children were buried on those grounds, right? So that is definitely Canada's shame and it is never being talked about outside. Nowadays, there is a uh, uh, raised awareness even within newcomer communities that this is in traditional indigenous territory. Right? And a lot of it is unceded land. So that is one aspect. Also in the 60s, there was something called the 60s scoop where indigenous children were removed from families and uh, given up for adoption in non-indigenous families. So children were just lost, right? So if you were to look at uh, writers like Richard Wagamese, he writes he was someone who was taken from his family through the 60s scoop. Right? And when you come back, you have been, your culture has been completely erased and you have been raised in shame and you have been raised with the burden of gratitude that you have been removed from the mess in which you were. Never mind that mess was started by somebody else. Right? So that is something that's still happening. In more recent arrivals, the impact of Islamophobia, anti-Black racism in social spaces and in work spaces does trickle back into the home. And as Marx said, for the working class man, his wife and children are his proletariat, right? So he comes home and that is the line of control. Somebody kicked me around outside. I'm going to come home and I'm going to kick you around because I have nowhere else to take it out, right? So Karl Marx talked about that, right? And he said that industrial model of someone at the top and someone at the bottom is replicated in the family because that man comes home and he takes it out on his wife and children, if you will, right? And those are things, and you're right, we need to have men's groups. We have to have young men's groups, sons talking about, we need to have intergenerational conversations between working class families, right? To say it is always like that. And I was interested in your conversation about very rich families don't want to leave and very poor women don't want to leave because in the material matrix, that is the situation, right? And what happens to everybody else? So absolutely, that's an excellent question because what happens from society 
does trickle into the family because families are indeed a part of the social. What a brilliant group of people here. Thank you, thank you, Rashmi, really. <laughs> thank you for your comment. I have just, I know that I, I should close the, the meeting, <laughs> but I have just a final question about uh, um, toxic patriarchy, but it's just my point of view of the, of the situation. I was wondering, um, it's a question about, uh, in particular for Eliane, because it's your field of uh, work uh, and research. And there is some reflection about the, um, the law on children custody. Uh, because, um, it, yeah, I was wondering um, uh, how the law uh, on children custody and also the arrangement uh, about children custody in court uh, um, frames also the, the, the problem of your research. So what, what kind of impact uh, this law has your specific problem, for example, about uh, uh, the use of drug uh, uh, and alcohol. Mm -hmm. But because in, in my experience, uh, this law mm, presents different problems in specific situation, for example, domestic violence. No, so mm, I guess if you have uh, some reflections about uh, the impact of the of this kind of law, uh, just because I think it is in, uh, in Switzerland, um, you have a law similar to uh, other um, uh, European countries uh, with shared custody by default. Uh, and um, so there is, there used to be this uh, general rule in um, countries such as Switzerland, many European countries, and as far as I know, also the United States, it was kept very traditional. Um, the mother stays at home, so she automatically gets to take care of the children, and uh, the father has to be the one who pays alimony. Uh, and there has been, as far as I know, in Switzerland, definitely a movement from fathers saying, wait a minute, so I get divorced from my uh, wife, I lose my children, I hardly see them. And I pay for everything. And this resulted in much more uh, flexible uh, forms of uh, parenting, shared parenting. So usually when a couple sort of gets along, they can share parenting, that children uh, get to live in both households. And the problem with that is, uh, Divorces are usually a battlefield, right? People usually don't come to court and say, sure, let's agree upon everything, unless they've done some coaching or um, conscious uncoupling. Um, so nonetheless, there's jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is ruling in my country uh, because it just simply says, the father, that's the baseline. The father at the very minimum gets to have the children every other weekend. And then especially when it comes to substance use disorder, it has nothing to do with gender. It's not about, is it the mother? Is it the father? Because I do have cases where fathers come see me and say, she's smoking pot all day long. I come home and she's completely zoned out. My children don't do their homework. I'm at work all day. What do I do? I don't want to, so to say, kill her, like damage her, but I am not okay as a father with what I'm seeing, with what's happening. So there again, it's important to see it has nothing to do with gender and it has nothing to do with jurisdiction. We cannot apply a rule to these cases um, that has been established because we like to put things as as human beings tick that way, we like the white or black box, this or that, because it's somehow easier to our brains. So we got to think a little bigger. It's what is the issue? What caused the divorce? Is there substance use disorder? And then have a look at how can we help the children and the parents? Because we, you then have to look at who's making more money who's more capable, willing, and able 
to take care of the child. Uh, and then lastly, we have to think of the social costs. This whole misery is costing us as a society, money-wise, financially, uh, healthcare being bearably affordable. In Switzerland, it's a huge topic every year. Health uh, healthcare insurance is a tremendous issue for families. And it's costing us because it's, it's making children ill. That's what it does. It, uh, I mean, there's a trend going on in Hollywood. Everyone's saying, oh, my, my therapist. In my understanding, this is not, it, it, this is not, a, it can't be a trend to say, oh yeah, I, I had my fifth uh, relapse. I'm going to another beautiful institution and uh, it's, it's okay. For me, it's not okay because it's very saddening what's happening. Thank you. Thank you, Elian, for your experience. Thank you. I think that uh, uh, about this law, the problem is that um, is not able to frame and to rule specific situations because uh, there is uh, an application by default, a shared custody by default. So for many situations it's fine, but for other several situations it's not fine because we need to understand uh, very well that specific situation of the domestic violence uh, um, and other problems because there are families have different problems. And uh, I think that uh, it's a, a very, a very big issues because I, I saw in my, because my, in, in first, in the first part of my career, I worked as a, a court appointed expert uh, for courts. So uh, and I come from a different uh, field as a practitioner. So I, I, I saw many times that uh, there is the general rule, uh, the judge, uh, applies the general rule, the shared custody by default, but it, it doesn't work <laughs> in many situations. So I think that is not, uh, as you told, it's not a, a problem about gender, but it's a problem about the system, how the system works. So, yeah. so I think that um, it is important to try to promote uh, some reflection about uh, how the system doesn't work <laughs> in many situations. Yeah. So thank you. I think that we are approaching to the end of the session because uh, we have five minutes, but I should leave. <laughs> so I don't know if, uh, if there are questions, they are very, very welcome. So we can use this last five minutes. Um, I put in the chat the link to the page for the session. And I highly encourage you to go there and continue discussion there. And <clears throat> to share this page with other people, um, other scholars, but also other activists or so forth who are involved in the projects and the topics that you're involved in so that you know this becomes a good resource and we can begin to, you know, it, that we can continue what we've begun here. So I just uh, wanted to remind you that this is, this discussion will be up on that page and other people might see this discussion and you know have a chance to comment there but also you can come and comment some ideas that you might have after leaving here because i know i always have like oh why didn't i say that or why didn't i say this so um so i would encourage you to use that resource and to share that resource um I'm hoping Rashmi will share it on Twitter with her Twitter account, you know, and so forth. So <laughs> anyway, so I just wanted to point that out that that's very much still available and will remain up long after uh, the conference is completed, which you guys are the end. So the conference is going to be completed when we leave here. So thank you very much for being a part of it. Thank you very much for coordinating this because it's extremely wonderful that, you know, we can all get together like this. And Patty, thank you very much for your help with all the uploading of the video and all that. Much appreciated. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, I, I would like to thank again all the speakers and participants for very, very interesting discussion. And uh, um, I think that we can also, as Patti told, I think that we can try to establish new connections and networking uh, among us and, and with other, our scholars. So it's, uh, it's very important that it's our aims. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And I also wanted to say thank you for all the work that you do to make every like the voices of your research communities heard and you know to make the case for different marginalized groups all over the globe. So thank you. Thank you. So I wish you all a, a, a continuation, good continuation with your research and your activities and activism. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.